This episode is sponsored by ATB. Mom, what does ATB stand for? Alberta Treasury Branch. Next question. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you know the name of their campaign? Built to Help Albertans. Next question. That's right. And speaking of questions, they're there to answer your questions that are commonly asked by Albertans in these tough times. Karen, what's a commonly asked question that you never get an answer to? Um, why doesn't Neil Diamond love me? Perfect. ATB, you better get on it. In 1938, yeah. they were open. They provide supports for Albertans during these hard times. Like when Karen asks you a question, you know, you have to let her down easy. But ATB is still there to support Albertans through the bad and the good. Everyone thinks Neil Diamond's old. ATB is older than Neil Diamond. (laughs) That's right. We're dropping actual facts here. But they're also here to help Albertans because it's a downturn. People are slowly recovering and it's not quite over, but they're built to help Albertans. So they're going to rebuild and we're going to find a new normal. And ATB is going to give you a call and tell you about Neil Diamond. You should get an account there. I have one. I have a debit. I've raised you well. Good for me. Yeah. Tell me your dreams over bacon and eggs. We'll share a laugh and a story and On the breakfast dish. Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen Johnson Diamond, and my social insurance number is. No, no, no. And I'm here co hosting. Sorry, your social insurance number is the Charlie Brown teacher? No, that's. It's like Morse code. My son, Griffin Cork, is my co host, and his social insurance number is. And we host this <laughs> podcast called The Breakfast Dish. Hey, Griff, how are you? Tell us what this podcast's about. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our favorite game show we all know and love. Say with me, studio audience, the Breakfast Dish. We all uh, (laughs) chat with uh, artists and folks who are making online or digital or socially distant art. uh, And they're they're making stuff happen throughout the pandemic. We want to know who they are. We want to know what they're making. We want to know how they're making it. Uh, 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 Karen, uh, explain the game show portion. Oh, yes. It's the game show portion is uh, guess my sin number. (laughs) And uh, we have our guests on the show. And uh, if you get it right, you cannot leave. We'll lock the door. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, we always check to see if there's anything we shouldn't talk about. We always make sure if there's any topics off the table. And our guests said, not the sin numbers. And and then I just had to go with it. So at (laughs) some point. And then it turned out that that was the only bit we used for the entire intro. (laughs) (laughs) I have other bits. I I have other bits. It's just. Give Give me one right now. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to talk on this podcast about obsessions. I'm going to talk about obsessions. And you know how I like to get Neil Diamond in within the first like three minutes of every single podcast? I like to mention my obsession with Neil Diamond. Okay. Our guests have similar uh, likes in their worlds. And I will be talking about that. It's it's something called Next Fest. Yeah, yeah, but also in their own lives. I, I was the last one in the meeting. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Do you have an obsession? Like, honestly, Griff, do you have a thing in your life yet that is me and Neil Diamond? Uh, So certainly not you and Neil Diamond. That's that's for certain. Uh, Nothing you would change your name for? Nothing I would change my name for. I would say the thing that I'm probably obsessed with is zombies. I love zombies. Any kind of zombie media will never get uh, uh, too tired for me. Movies, TV shows, video games. I'm pretty... I would say that's maybe the closest thing. Okay, great, awesome. What, well, you, what would you say mine is? Uh, I, d- I don't, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Mac and cheese, KD. Mm, I would go Annie's before I'd go KD. Yeah, you're right, Annie's. You're right. <laughs> anyway, sp- speaking of KD, uh oh. <laughs> no, 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 you can. Do- K- I know. K- K- I set it second, up. I have KD. to figure it out. KD. KD and AD. Oh yeah. Speaking of KD, there's a, we have an uh, AD and an AP on our show today, right? No, an A, uh, F, 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 wait, F, F, D, and an F, P. <laughs> I, I think we got there. We got there. <laughs> yeah, we got there. <laughs> yeah, it took a few steps, but we got there. <laughs> the breakfast dish, taking a few steps to get there. <laughs> well, introduce our F, P, and F, Ds there, Griff. All right. Our, our, I've already forgotten the letters. Our F, D, and F, P are Ellen Chorley and Simone Medina Polo from Next Fest in Edmonton. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us on The Breakfast Dish. Thanks for having us. Uh, And you forgot part of the introduction. Uh, Ellen's uh, sin number is... (laughs) (laughs) And Simone's is... 
I can also pass along my credit card number. Oh yeah, could you do that? Could you give us your credit <laughs> yeah, card number, Simone? Absolutely. Simo? It's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes, by the end of the show, we're all going to have our 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 sensor sounds harmonized. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, uh, we were getting ready for the podcast, and and one of us was having audio problems, and, and I'm 54 year old me trying me. to solve it. You're calling like, me out, and it was me. <laughs> just like, I uh, listen. Let me tell you about audio things. <laughs> Simone goes, um, I'm an audio engineer. <laughs> oh, okay, you fix it then. <laughs> so uh, our new co-host, our new co-producer on this uh, podcast is now Simone, and. Uh, <laughs> And Griffin will be paying you out of his own bank account. <laughs> and she deserves it, frankly, I'll say it. <laughs> Next fest. Okay, let's go to Ellen first. 25 years, right? This is the 25th this is 26 year. 26th year. Shut years. up, Karen. It's the 26th year. <laughs> yeah, shut up, Karen. I did my math wrong. Years. <laughs> Get her, Ellen. I was like, oh, started in 1996. Yeah, so now I'm, and I did the math, but then it's, mm-hmm, yeah. I know. I I always get mixed up, too. We had to count the year, the the first year exactly as, i don't know i i just yeah. know that the document that we send out is 26 years and then every year we update it by one the way year I remember so. it, I'm, I'm a year older than the festival so that's how i remember perfect oh perfect okay great now we know when you were born and your <laughs> sin number and your credit card number what are the name of some of your pets <laughs> yeah by the end of this interview i'll be simone yes <laughs> First street you lived on. Oof, I wish I remembered that one. I was a baby then. (laughs) Ellen, how long have you been with Next Fest? Uh, I was a Next Fest artist when I was 16. So I've actually been with the festival for a really long time. Um, I've been the festival director. This is my fifth festival. And before that, I was the high school curator. And so I ran the high school program for the five years before that. So I guess I just figured it out yesterday that this is my... 10th year administratively with the festival and my fifth year as the festival um, director. Can you talk about all your firsts? I love it in your bio on the site. Yeah. Okay. So um, my first time doing Next Fest, I was 16. Um, I, okay. I think it was Steve. No, I, I think it was Steve Perot's first year as festival director, but I'm not sure. Um, but I think the math works out that way. And it was 2001. And um, we did a show, uh, so I was in the, on, an, um, a teen acting class at the Citadel Theater, uh, run by Heather Inglis, and, um, and what happened is, she, basically, we liked that class so much that we wanted to continue, like, building the project that we were working on, and so she approached uh, Next Fest and asked if we could, and, and so we did, and, and we performed in a Pilates studio, like, it wasn't even a theater, it was, like, turned into a theater, but it was like a Pilates studio. And then, uh, so that was a first. And then the next time that I did a first was I did, um, I was the first time I was ever paid to be a playwright when I was 19. Um, Steve, uh, Steve programmed my play Bohemia Perso. Um, and so that was amazing. That was so incredible. And I, I don't think I would have continued to pursue playwriting if it had not been for that moment. So that was really great. Uh, and also the first time I ever did burlesque was at Next Fest. Um, and that's a huge part of, of my career as well. So uh, really, Next Fest has really given me a lot of firsts, many, many, many firsts. And I'm, I'm, I just feel so grateful um, to be able to to be affiliated with this organization and and this festival because I I know that it it, it is important because it, it was important to me because it gave me these these I, I got to be like I have this weird thing where I think I want to take my clothes off <laughs> as an art form and they're like sure you know or whatever it is and and so yeah I'm very 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 grateful to be part of Next Fest. I do that every night, and nobody wants to pay me for it. <laughs> what? We're about bringing in some more glitter into it. Glitter right. always helps. And yeah. fans. It's a production value. Fans. It adds. Yeah, feathers really <laughs> help too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, what we actually haven't gotten into is what Next Fest is. I mean, I, I don't know that we oh. have very many listeners that that don't know, but but Simone, do you want to give us a little a little rundown of of 
what what the next fest festival is yeah absolutely um, uh so the nexus is is, is the nexus the nexus arts company is a company basically dedicated to developing the nexus festival which is centered around uplifting and basically developing the skills of emerging artists such as myself and ellen as uh, have been at some point or another and so uh yeah we basically tend to go for 10 days in a row with a lot of different like artists of diff different disciplines meeting together to um just share the work that, that they're doing the things that they're might be workshop they might be workshopping perhaps the things that you know they, they're wanting to start showing off to an audience so nexus is a lot about that like fair stage that first opportunity to develop as an artist and you know developing some of those more um how would i describe them like um like more professionalized skills i guess when it comes to doing arts in that professional setting so and i'd say that's very much my experience also as a next best emerging artist that has now become an artistic manager so and that's what you that is your chosen career path am i right yeah because you're at Grant Mac right now? I'm pretty all over the place. Like, my formal background is philosophy. Um, so my, my formal background is philosophy. I'm an audio engineer because I do music, but I do arts management because I like to help develop infrastructure to support communities. So that's how I ended up in Nexus. Amazing. I'm a, a mom and an actor. <laughs> that's all I got. That's all I got going on. Hey, hey, whoa. <laughs> and a podcast host. Oh, yes, it's true. Yeah, podcast host and expert on Neil Diamond. It's true. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that sounds like a Twitter bio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. I, th I think my Twitter handle says uh, actor, mom, obsessed fan or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think the last thing I forgot to mention about this year's Nexus is, so yeah, we're, we're going back online because we've done the transition since COVID started last year. Uh, we were one of the first festivals to make that transition. At that point, I wasn't the festival producer, but I was a curator for the Pride Night Club. So I got to see how Nexus uh, kind of took the risk to do something that a lot of people weren't sure how it was going to pan out, and it actually became an industry standard across the board in many ways. This year, we're going back with uh, online, and we're doing it through, uh, from June 3rd to the 13th. So we're very excited for it. And, and this is your, and sorry, just so I, I know, this is your first year as festival producer. Yes, that's correct. Is there one job that you have to do that you didn't know that you had to do? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's a, That's good, a question. good question. <laughs> I I'm not really sure. I knew that a lot of like herbals would end up my way because uh, you know doing an administrative position that's a position where you kind of have to think on your feet at very different times. No one is going to like right. tell you like this is the list of things to do. So I have to make those lists for myself. I have I um I have to remember to be the one to tell people like hey, these are the lists of things and here are the deadlines of things. And reminding myself to maintain those de deadlines consistently. Um so it's it's been an interesting thing. I, I I'm trying to think of the biggest curveballs that I've been thrown my way, but most of these things I kind of anticipated because of my background in arts and cultural management. But also like I, I don't know, like last last year I learned a lot from like getting to work with Ellen and Maggie very closely at times. So I just kind of got to have a little bit of perspective on, over what their job entails. So I uh, listened to this. I was looking at the schedule online. So it's an online festival that transitioned from live. And this is this is one day's offering. OK, the very first day of the festival, Thursday, June 3rd. There's music, digital theater, film, high school theater, a showcase, dance, and a nightclub. And a live social insurance number reading from the <laughs> festival director and festival producer. I'll be doing that while dressed in a meat dress. Uh, but all that plus... <laughs> um, Plus workshops. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we do, uh, we have at least one daily workshop every day that is free for anyone to attend. Uh, basically, the workshops have been developed to help um, emerging artists build new skills or learn more about the business of art or that kind of stuff. It depends on the year. Basically, what we do is we we survey our artists and we say, like, what kind of, what's your dream workshop, basically? Um, and there is audio engineering this year. And but Simone's not teaching that, right? No, I brought a friend of mine. I was going to say, you got another, you have more things to do. Anyway, carry on. Simone is doing a workshop on um, uh, putting, getting your album out there because Simone just released an album as well. I don't know if you folks do that. 
<laughs> Simone can tell you more about it than I can, but... The Ghost Notes is, uh, like, I've been producing music uh, music as a hyper-pop artist, so, like, a very exaggerated version of experimental pop under the name Pseudo Antigone, which you've been seeing over here a whole bunch. Yeah, like, why is that your handle? Yeah, Pseudo that's because Antigone. this is my, my artist Zoom, and I end up jumping into every meeting, professional or not, with it accidentally. I keep forgetting to switch it over. But I released an album at the beginning of May called Into the Voice of Infinite Sadness, and they actually made some rounds, like, it it was featured on Exclaim mag- mag- uh, Magazine and uh, the Edmonton Journal, so it, it went a long ways. Uh, and this was my debut in doing this kind of thing. So, so yeah. Say the title again so I can write it down. Yeah, Into the Void of Infinite Sadness. I'll type it in the chat for reference. Okay, thank Listeners, you. Listeners, you best believe that I have a link to this in the podcast oh. description, or I I can't <laughs> I can't call myself a podcast host. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, it, it, you know, the experience with that one was, like, it, it was just a very successful distribution and promotion effort. So now I just kind of want to pass down those, the, uh, like, things to other folks that are looking to do that. And that's kind of how Nexus works, right? We just kind of yeah. disseminate these things with each other. Yeah. So, so Simone's doing, dis- distributing an album. I'm doing Playwriting 101. And then we've brought on some really amazing um uh, workshop hosts uh, for this year. So we have um, a mental health piece. We have a lot of like digital creation stuff. So um, how to how to do online uh, or digital auditions or self tapes, basically um, uh, voiceover for commercials and uh, commercial work. Um, we have what else do we have? We have um, stuff about using treaty acknowledgments in art and how to how to properly do that and what to consider when you're you're building a treaty acknowledgement. Um, we have a really cool panel uh, this year about how to create art um, with more than one language. So if if English isn't your first language or if it is but you speak a second language or if you want to create a piece with more than one language, um, how do you even go about that? So we have um, so we have French creators coming. We have um, a deaf creator coming to that panel. I think it's going to be really fascinating. Um, I'm probably missing. We have a total of 13 workshops, so <laughs> I'm probably missing some of them, but like one a day usually, one or two a day. Here's the thing. As I was researching the festival, I wrote down the like the podcast or the workshops that really like sparked my interest. I wrote down everything you just said. I wrote like, the other languages, intro to voice acting, playwriting basics, audio engineering, and the camera loves you. Great. We're covered. Uh, end of the episode. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, <laughs> ciao. There's so many other workshops, though, but those are the ones that I was just like, that's the proof that you can take this festival and still support emerging artists that are now having to learn how to do things digitally. Uh, but there's also a workshop called Non-Dancing that yeah. really strikes. Like, I just... It's like, we're going to make stupid moves and laugh at ourselves. And I'm like, yes! It's going to be so fun. And I think that's a great way to do, like, if you're feeling a little bit cooped up in, in your home or if you're, you're, you're wanting to, to, you know, to get out of, out of your body or out of, of, you know, this pandemic funk, non-dancing might be a perfect thing for you because it's going to get you in your body and it's going to be a great way to connect with people. And I think that's why I love the workshops. It's just a really great way to meet people and connect with people yeah. Obviously, it's way more fun when you're in the same room with them. But um, if you can't be in the same room with people, at least you can connect digitally. And then our hope is that obviously next year we'll be back in the same room together as well. And I just love the workshops. Listen, listen, there's the other thing that I'm obsessed about uh, is the tax handbook for artists. <laughs> yeah, Simone, talk about that one. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, probably Ellen has a little bit more background of it. I, I personally like it because I do like making those resources that are like, you know, the things that artists don't want to think about, like, oh, tax taxes, or oh, I have to send an invoice. Um, so a, a few years ago, before my role as a festival producer, uh, folks asked our accountant to help develop a... Um, you know, like a breakdown of how to do taxes as an artist. And so we have this resource available for people that are trying to figure out like, okay, I'm starting to get paid for my art. How do I report this to the government as income? And that stuff gets really daunting. Uh, So it's really nice to have something there. We try to keep it on the website, like at all times. So next year, next April, like, well, March, I guess, if you're, if you're an artist and you're trying to figure out your taxes or you're doing your taxes for the first time, um, uh, like, 
go to our website at nextfest.ca and it should be up there taxes for artists and then you can just it's just a pdf you can download it right these are links to infos yeah not it's not a lecture it's not a workshop this is like permanent links yeah it's just a per it's like a handbook it's like so you can download it and it sort of walks you through it and um yeah, it, we basically, we had artists come to us and say, like, I want to learn how to do my taxes as a workshop. And we were kind of like, well, I, it, everyone's a little bit different, so we can't really do a workshop. But I think it would be more valuable if we had something that you could read step by step and go through it, basically. So so we have that on the website pretty much all the time, but definitely kind of during tax season, for sure, every year. So I would like very much to use this moment to, like, motherly nag my son, see? Griffin, this is how you need you need to go. But he's finished his taxes, and I haven't yet. So I did my taxes. <laughs> so he's ahead of me now. I know for me, um, and a lot of artists that I've worked with, or a lot of artists that I see coming into the into the festival, um, there is sort of this like scary blind spot on the business of being an artist where um and it's like you don't want to look at it because it's too scary you know what I mean like taxes writing grants writing grant reports making a budget that kind of stuff asking for sponsorship and a, and a lot of artists don't know how to do that and it is a really it is kind of a scary thing I know when I was starting to first produce the idea of writing a grant was so scary to me because I was just afraid that I would like mess it up and then mess up the rest of my life somehow. You know what I mean? It's just a grant, but you know how it is. So, uh, so we, we really do try to like help artists in, in that way and help, help them to understand contracts and, and just sort of help them to understand that stuff to make it a little bit easier on them when they're when they're outside of a uh, of this festival and they're creating their art and they need to know the business side of it. So hello, Ellen. This is the Edmonton Arts Council. <laughs> We're uh, going to take your dog. You'll have bad luck for the rest of your <laughs> life. We've denied your grant, and yeah. also uh, renting will be harder for you. <laughs> that you know that's yeah. Uh, it, it is something that I wished. Boy, oh boy, I had when I was starting out. And luckily, I married a man who is actually a financial planner that, you know, taught me about investing and stuff. But he teaches, my husband, Griffin's dad, teaches out at Rosebud every year on that sort of business of being an artist and, and how you can still invest and how you can still save and all that sort of stuff. And and I don't know, did you ever get that at the U of A, Griff? Did you get any courses or guidance like that? Yeah, uh, probably less than I would have liked. It, it was kind of mashed into the one lar- large, like, professional development course. So, like, one day we learned about Actra, one day we learned about one day we learned about grant writing. One day we learned about taxes. Right. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, s- smatterings. It's a, it's a lot to pack into a one semester course. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's a whole year of learning to be an yeah. actor who isn't just putting their receipts in a co op reusable shopping bag. <laughs> <laughs> Griffin, can I transition into obsessions for a minute, please? I I I hope you do because I just I, I want to hear about um, Garfield. And Wuthering Heights. This is what I want to hear about. So, <laughs> Simone, everything about Garfield, go. Okay, so, uh, like, the first thing that I always like to share with people about Garfield tends to be that uh, Jim Davis really wanted to pitch a movie to Disney on Garfield uh, titled Garfield's Judgment Day. No one <laughs> took him seriously. Like, no one would accept uh, him... Um, pitching this movie to people. So he ended up just making it into a graphic novel. It was actually published. So if you search up Garfield's Judgment Day, it exists. It's out there. And it's about uh, basically a storm hits the town uh, that they live in. And uh, basically like Garfield, John and Odie end up homeless at the end of it. Uh, So it's like pretty weird. And it's like one of the more like serious like takes on Garfield that Jim Davis has done. Um, when I applied for this job, I gave a presentation on Garfield, too. Uh, like, that was my fun presentation to just kind of introduce who I am as a person. And <laughs> what what else? Oh, uh, yeah, so there's this guy on YouTube called Quentin Reviews. And for all six and purposes, he is a Garfield historian. And he recently found out that before Garfield was published, the original version of the comic was called John, and it was about John. So later version, like the the versions of Garfield that we know once he was syndicated, are early versions of Garfield. Uh, sorry, early versions of John that were just risking to make Garfield the center of it. So those are three oh. major fun facts about Garfield in like a few in like a minute. I I, I just I just googled it like Simone suggested. <laughs> 
and there is an un there's a recording of a song that was supposed to be in the unfinished Garfield feature film. It's it, it's, but, it's all true. How many years ago was that film pitched, Simone? Like I want to say it was like late eighties, early nineties, uh, because that's ca- kind of what I remember of it. So it's, it w- it would have been an interesting <laughs> time for that to come out. <laughs> and is the creator still with us? Still alive? Oh, uh, Jim Davis. Yeah. Uh, Jim Davis is still alive. I am pretty sure. I need to double check my facts there because. If he pitched it now, it would go. Like, somebody would grab it now. Yeah, if you make a serious Detective Pikachu movie, you can make a Garfield exactly. Judgment Day. <laughs> it's just Independence Day, but Garfield. So Jim Davis is still alive. Uh, I do agree. Uh, Garfield's Judgment Day would happen a lot more, especially because Garfield has been mimified into an eldritch creature of the internet now. So people <laughs> would want that. People would want that really bad. Um yeah, the other thing is, uh, yeah, so Pause Incorporated, which is like Jim Davis's uh, like business that used to run the comics once he got rich enough from the merchandise and stuff. Um, yeah, he recently got sold out to Nickelodeon. So, um, so you know, the landscape of Garfield and how Garfield is distributed is going to change again. It's going to be the dark Garfield, like they did the dark Spider-Man. <laughs> Garfield 2, rise again. Garfield, this time it's personal. <laughs> All right. Uh, speaking of uh, personal, no, I always set myself up for these segues I cannot do. <laughs> yeah, you could. The topic could end. I can't. Okay, speaking of personal, uh, Ellen's a person and she reads this book. Uh, there. Nice. <laughs> Ellen. Very true. Uh, yes. Wuthering Heights. Yeah, that's right. I collect copies of the book Wuthering Heights. And why I do that is basically I stumbled onto Wuthering Heights. Um, while I was researching a play, I, I wrote a play about um, the three Bronte sisters. And to research that play, I read Wuthering Heights. Um, and for me, it was just the story of it. So uh, if folks aren't um, aware of the story, it's this uh, fairly dense novel where um, a, a tenant uh, writes down the story that's being told to him by the nurse, which was then told to the nurse by the people that the story is about. So it's like a lot of narrators, uh, but it's about, it's basically about this very fraught, very, um, uh, toxic relationship between, um, Kathy and Heathcliff. And, um, I think for me, what I realized was, um, I, w- I, I was born in the 80s, and so I grew up in the late 80s and the early 90s. And when when love was presented to me, like romantic love, it was very binary, and it was very happily ever after. Like, if you think about, like, the toys that you had in, in the late, early 90s or the late 80s, they, like, the girl toys were very, very pink, mm-hmm. and they were very, very, like, princessy and, like, happily ever after sort of toys, and that's how Barbie was modeled at that time and that kind of stuff. And also, like, the media that I was consuming was, like, princess movies from Disney, basically. Like that's what my childhood was like. And I really liked those things, but to then see a story where love was, was romantic love was presented in such a complicated and harrowing way. And and I felt it was very truthful to my experience with romantic love. And it, and, and I was listening to it as I was driving back from Calgary one time, I was listening to it as a book on tape and, um, it, I was just sitting in the car and I just felt my heart like break open basically. And so I'm driving back from Calgary, listening to this story and just weeping and weeping and weeping, just like, just like breaking apart basically. And it really like hit my soul in a really, in a really amazing way. So, uh, because of that, it's just become my favorite book. And, um, and, and it's a very, very common book to find in bookstores and in, um, secondhand stores. So basically now if I go to a secondhand store or a bookstore, I just look to see if they have a copy of Wuthering Heights. And if they do, especially if it's secondhand, I'll usually buy it and then add it to my collection. And so now I have a full, uh, bookcase of, of different copies of Wuthering Heights because it's been printed so many times in different forms, basically. So yeah, I, I just love, I love, and I have like Wuthering Heights stuff, like a Wuthering Heights mug and a Wuthering Heights like lunch kit. picture. And um, <laughs> uh, I don't have a lunch kit, but I would love one. <laughs> you have, please, somebody, if you know where to get one. Oh, or make one. Uh, you have 176 copies or something. You have like. Oh, 107 copies. 100, Not that 176, 107. 107 copies, I think at this point. 
yeah, I have a lot of copies. So, and I just like the smell of old books too. So that's kind of about that and that kind of stuff. So yeah. Yeah. That's my weird, weird obsession. Super weird obsession. I love it. Actually, now that I explained the whole thing, like no, it's, it's weird. No, it's not. Listen, have you heard <laughs> me talk about Neil Diamond? Griffin, can you edit the earlier segue out and listen to this one? Listen. So uh, speaking we'll of Garfield, Garfield is a cartoon cat. Heathcliff is a cartoon cat. Heathcliff is a character in Wuthering Heights. Boom! <laughs> Nice. Yeah. I love that because as soon as I heard Heathcliff, I was like, oh boy, this needs to come up. I yeah. saw you. I saw you smoke. You're like, what? Who is yeah. so Both me and Simone just light up for a second like, huh? <laughs> uh, okay. Well, wait. Now, Karen, I want I want a fun Neil Diamond fact. Uh, yes. Well, this one I always tell everybody. His middle name is Leslie. Neil Leslie Diamond. <laughs> uh, and I. this is another fun fact. It, yeah. Tell one, tell one you haven't told on The Breakfast Dish before. This is have a, I this told is a Ice Cherry? Business. Have I told Ice Cherry? Yeah. Yeah. And, you have to okay, Ice Cherry. Uh, just in case for people, he was going to change his name to Ice Cherry or <laughs> Noah Kaminsky because he didn't think Neil Diamond sounded like a real name, but it is. Uh, he used to smoke two and a half <laughs> packs. But it is. It used to smoke two and a half packs of camels a day. And uh, according to the unauthorized biography of Neil Diamond, he left his first wife when she was eight months pregnant. So, Oh, Neil. Right? This, but this it's Neil. because he was looking for me. That's right. Yeah. What? Uh, Griffin, zombie fact, zombie fun fact, or Annie's yeah, mac and I cheese wanna, fun I fact. I want a zombie fact. Hmm. Um, one of the ultimate uh, self defense tools uh, in a zombie apocalypse is an old, I think it's World War II style trench pick. Uh, because it has a brass knuckles on the handle, so there's the blunt edge, and mm. then the piercing edge of a pickaxe. Thank goodness you know that. Yeah, so all you uh, you have to go to a museum and make sure one is battle ready, and then you'll be fine. It turns out. <laughs> Are we going to have one made by the same person that's going to make the Wuthering Heights lunch kit? Yeah, right. All my all my metallurgy friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there not a book series? I know there's Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Is there Wuthering Heights and Zombies? I don't think that they've done that yet, though. I think if they did a book series, it would be like Wuthering Heights and Ghosts because uh, right. there's already tons of ghosts in it. But, um, I, I mean, I guess it could be Zombies because they don't really leave. It's just two houses. They go back and forth between two houses the whole time, basically. So they could do Zombies if they're trying to, like, make up, like, a... Like you know, a compound or something, but mm -hmm. yeah, probably they probably fight ghosts first. I'm guessing this is my <laughs> favorite thing about this podcast. So this podcast was built out of the fact that I used to go out for breakfast with people uh, that I knew or didn't know or whatever, and we'd have breakfast, and I'd I'd introduce them to the Facebook world of my friends, you know, because that's so important. But you know what I mean? Like I would just go, here's a person that I just got to know and you should know. And I would always love these tidbits. Like I just... And weirdly enough, all of them brought up Garfield Judgment Day. <laughs> This is like the 14th person that's brought that up. Griffin, I have a fun next best fact for you. <gasps> hit me, hit me. It's zombie related. Oh, good idea. Uh, my first Nexus was in 2015 and the performance I was involved was like a coordinated zombie thing. I oh don't have any other be better way to describe it, but I was at Zombie for my first Next Fest. So I just find it really funny this keeps coming up. Amazing. Listen, zombies are always keep coming up. They come back from the dead. Ha <laughs> ha. Nice joke, Griff. Ellen has to find some tie between Wuthering Heights and Neil Diamond. Go. <laughs> um... <laughs> Like, did he ever work with Kate Bush? <laughs> he pro he has books, too. How's that? Neil Diamond also yeah. has books. <laughs> Speaks in English. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. We're finding him. That's like four already. <laughs> we're on a roll. We're doing okay. All right. Let's get in a little bit to the uh, brass tacks of Next Fest. You've already mentioned the dates. Uh, um, but how do people attend? Do they go to the site? It, what's the what is the ticket pricing? Uh, what is there a directory, a schedule? G give me all that good, good facts. Definitely. Uh, well, you know everything has gone on online, um, and you can watch Nexus both from the live stream that is uh, that's going to be on nexus.ca/slash nexus TV, or we're going to have a few things that are on demand that you can access throughout the whole festival, so you don't have to show up at a specific time at a specific moment to catch a certain thing uh, and that's going to be on nexus.ca slash on hyphen demand okay yeah so the entire festival is going to be 
online, free, and it can be watched from anywhere with an internet access. So if you have Wi-Fi, uh, you're fine. <laughs> Wait, the whole festival's free, not just workshops? Yeah, every single thing is free. Yeah. Shut the front door. <laughs> yeah. And also for anyone who's concerned with accessibility, uh, we are going to have open captions throughout the entire festival. So I, I know I, I process like things better when there's words underneath things. So I personally appreciate it lots. And I'm sure a lot of other people would appreciate it lots to know that. Yeah, for sure. And and also, um, if you're a little bit worried about um, a content or if you're watching with younger audience members, every piece before we show it, we give live content warnings so that you know... Great. Um, what you what to expect. So if you need to, you know, walk away from your computer for a second, or if you need to mute your computer or turn down the brightness or something like that, you can absolutely do that. Um, and then it allows you to sort of engage with the content a way that you want to basically. Um, yeah. So we're trying to make it as accessible for everyone to, to take part in as much as they want to. Well, you have content warnings even on the workshops, which is Great. Yes, we do have yep. content warnings, yeah, on the workshops too, yeah. You will have to expose your social insurance number in this workshop. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> We're making so many jokes about it, and that is the one thing we talked about that we can't <laughs> talk about. We're bad hosts. You know what? Some Next Fest emerging artist uh, needs to be reminded about the importance of their SIN number and whether or not they should provide it. Should it go on a contract? Should it not? When is it okay to text it to someone? Never. So that... And you should have it memorized like all all four of the people on this episode. All four of us have it memorized? No problem. I I, I actually do. No no need to check? Do you actually care? I do. I know my I think you're the only one. I think I both... I saw Ellen and Simone. I think it's an age thing. Prove it. Yes, it's it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. (laughs) You got the first one. That's amazing. (laughs) Good for you. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's interesting because not all organizations have there's the same standards for things. Uh, like nope. I know the, the one that I learned through working with Nexus is, you know, like some organizations have uh, T4As, which are different than T4s. Uh, T4s are the general ones that you get through any employer that has ha- hired you. So not just like someone that is being your client, but when you're working with an organization like ours that actually does T4As, um, we are basically, basically required to... Um, to take people's SIN numbers for anyone who gets paid over five, $500. Yeah. Which has been one that I, I keep rem- I keep sometimes rem- asking Maggie, my mentor slash the former festival director, like, hey, what's the threshold again? <laughs> right. Because you don't have to ask if you're paying <laughs> under this much, but you do if you're paying over that much. Exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I'm always freaking out because it's usually like some online contract, you know, that you're doing in a PDF you know, you're signing it through a PDF thing. And I'm like, I don't know if I type this in here. But I know I'm I'm one of those old people, like my mom's still like, I don't know about debit cards and banks. I like to talk to a person. So I'm always like afraid to put, t- I, I, I'm okay with my credit card, but my SIN number, I'm like, should I put this on the interwebs? I don't know. Well, SIN is, <laughs> I mean, SIN, getting your SIN hacked is very yeah. bad. I remember yeah. there was that one uh, uh, internet security company the CEO put their SIN number on, like, the side of a truck and then drove the truck around. I think it was New York. I don't remember which company this was. But he, they were so confident in their internet security that that's what they did. And he had his internet, he had his identity stolen 13 times. <laughs> <laughs> the hubris is pretty strong. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, which is like, oh, that's shocking. Course. Shocking. I, I love that you care so much about your internet security company. But, oh, like, your life is... Because you don't get a new one. You can't have another one. I kind of like when people just say like, okay, I'm not comfortable. Can I give you a phone call? And I'm like, yeah, I want to hear a human voice. And like, I get it. I I get it. And here's my human voice popping in to say that The Breakfast Dish is part of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The intro music you just heard and the outro music you're about to hear is by Alexandra Kalman, who learned tax advice from, I guess, my father at Rosebud Theatre, yeah. and all graphic design for The Breakfast Dish has been done by Morgan Ermter. Karen, what's coming up? Well, speaking of emerging and free uh, okay. and lunch kits, <laughs> this is great. I want to talk about Lunchbox Theatre's <laughs> Stage 1 Festival 2021. So they just recently finished the Stage 1 Festival 2020 Redux, um, but these 
this coming weekend, June 5th and 6th, and the weekend of June 19th and 20th, they are showcasing eight new plays, Canadian plays, uh, one-act plays that you can listen to for free at lunchboxtheater.com. There's uh, four plays each weekend. So on the 5th, there's one at noon and one at 6. On the 6th, there's one at noon and one at 6, and goes the same way on the week of June 19th and 20th. Outstanding. Ellen, thank you. Oh, my God. Ellen Simone, thank you for joining us on The Breakfast Dish. Thank you for having us. It, it was delightful. I almost called you pseudo Antigone. <laughs> Th- that's okay. I've been actually hoping that people start calling me by my artist. I want to become like, you know how people just call Bjork Bjork? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I kind of want to slowly become just an entity as an artist. Okay, great. Uh, uh, let me let me just go let me just go back on that one second. Back to ones. Back to ones. Okay, back to ones. Ellen, pseudo Antigone, thank you for joining us on The Breakfast Dish. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. It was so fun. Oh, it was. Oh, my gosh. What we like to do to wrap things up on The Breakfast Dish is Karen will ask you a question. And it might have something to do with what we talked about. Uh, it may not. She's a professional improviser, so she's going to make it up right now. Three, two, one. Okay, Ellen, what uh, is Heathcliff's favorite breakfast? Oh, like an empty plate with two tears on it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Have you thought about this before? Whatever. Whatever. Sor- whatever, if you could eat sorrow, that, that's what he would like to eat for breakfast. We call this the dewdrop delicatessen. <laughs> Along those lines, uh, Simone, imagine Garfield in like a dirty um, apron uh, with a chef's cap on and a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. What is the name of his diner? Oh, my God. Um, I want to say it's Garfield Eats, too, because Garfield Eats is no longer a thing. Yes. There we go. <laughs> Uh, and Karen, we're going to need you to take us out uh, with your uh, most pleasant uh, sensor sound. Oh, this is a censored sound. Whatever you think you're listening to right now, you don't get to listen to. This is uh, ASMR. Eleanor, you sound like an evil about robot this. that's about Do to I? take over the world. Okay, I'm how about sorry, this? Dave. Um, I'm not going to let you listen to what's going on right now. I'm and, censoring. And, it's and totally cut, censored. Cut the episode. <laughs> This episode of The Breakfast Dish is brought to you by the Calgary Foundation, proudly supporting community needs for 65 years. When I'm 65. Everyone wants to feel a sense of belonging. Now, more than ever, we are united by a desire to take action and help others by creating a community built on kindness and compassion. That's, that's just, this is a very good ad for our podcast. Calgary Foundation is all about kindness. Why? Because did they sponsor this podcast in the beginning? The founding, the first baby steps of The Breakfast Dish? Yeah. With a little grant. What else about grants from Calgary Foundation? (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, from small creative projects to larger citizen-led initiatives, the Calgary Foundation provides grassroots grants to encourage and support people like me and Karen who want to create and strengthen bonds between neighbors and communities. Oh, my God, this is us. If Griffin and I had a stronger bond, he would call me mom instead of Karen. Okay, well, you could talk to them about this. So if you've got an idea to improve, enhance, or revitalize your community or neighborhood, visit calgaryfoundation.org to find out more about the Foundation's grant opportunities. And you can visit the Calgary Foundation's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channel. And sometimes they share our podcast a little bit. And you can also improve your community by calling your mommy mom. (laughs) This has been The Breakfast Dish.